And I, I had heard that actually that did happen. A miracle did occur. When did they go in to operate? When did that happen? Did they have to fly you back to the United States to do that? You know, that's really a much bigger story than we even have time to share because as the surgeon explained to me Daryl's head injury and told me that his frontal lobe had been collapsed, his sinuses were destroyed, his brain tissue had torn and his brain had been exposed. Then she went on to say, but we can't take care of him here. You need to get him to better medical care. They gave me a very um, low prognosis of his survival, said that he had less than a 40% chance of surviving surgery. And if he survived, he'd be a, a vegetable the rest of his life. Well, he doesn't look like a vegetable. Uh, no, he's a you know, pretty normal guy. God performed an amazing miracle for him. You know, we didn't get to fly out of the country together, though. I was flying off to Hawaii for brain surgery, but the, the plane was fully booked, and they wouldn't kick passengers off for Sherry and the kids because they weren't a medical emergency. So they're left behind. I'm flying off to Hawaii for surgery, and I didn't want to leave them behind, and I didn't want to face surgery alone. But on a Sunday morning, all I could do at the airport was pray for my wife and my kids and commit them to the Lord, not knowing if I'd see them again in this life. I got on a plane and flew out of the country. And that was probably the most amazing moment for us as a family, realizing that we were again separated. We had no control over what was happening in our lives. And as we were driving back to town, the kids and I began to worship and praise the Lord. And then our son said, Mom, God just told me Dad won't have to have surgery. I responded like a typical mom. I said, that's nice, son. I didn't think he understood what the doctor had been telling me. You know, it was a 22-hour flight for me with the layovers. And I had an IV and a nurse was with me. Finally, at St. Francis Hospital, the neurosurgeon said, I've read your x-rays. My team is waiting in surgery. We're anticipating eight hours of reconstructive surgery. But he says, the only promise I can make you is that we will do our very best for you. But he said, let's do a CAT scan first. And when he did the CAT scan, it did not agree with the x-rays. Between the x-ray and the CAT scan, God had totally restored my brain and my, my frontal lobe, my sinuses, everything. He just left this little number six dent as a reminder of how good he is. Well, that's incredible. Wow. Yeah, you can see the dent. But it, it actually, is, actually makes you look cuter, actually. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I left the hospital out less than 24 hours after I arrived and never had a problem since physically from that injury whatsoever. I got on the phone and called Sherry. She was on the island that did have telephone service at that point. Told her God healed me and I would meet her at the airport. That is amazing at the airport. And so then you got on a flight? Well, we were able to get on a flight the next day and then we had an overnight in Guam. So it still took us two days to get to where Daryl was. but. By that time, the family was thrilled and rejoicing. And, and then, you know, we were beginning to realize we had some emotional wounds that were really serious, and we were going to need help with that. But, you know, I think for us, the greatest miracle is that we were able to heal physically and emotionally, and then we were able to forgive, and we believe that's what truly brought us to health. Well, you know, a lot of people might say, why do you think God would allow something like this to happen to somebody who's over on an island there as missionaries to try to reach out to the local people there only for you to be horrifically attacked? What would you say to that, Daryl? Well, there's a lot of things that, that a person could say from my own experience. However, I was trusting God in the midst of the whole ordeal because it's a life of faith, not a life of sight. Uh, as the years passed, God did share with me why bad things happen to good people and actually shared with me why he allowed us to go through this circumstance. Didn't you say you heard an audible voice? I, I did hear God's audible voice in uh, 1987 uh, when God spoke to me and said, do you really want to know why people suffer? And I responded and he did share that with me. Would you like me to share that? Sure. He said, when my son came into the world, I was very concerned about his physical comfort and safety, and what men did to him broke my heart. But I was less concerned with his physical comfort and safety than I was the spiritual condition of a lost and dying world. What happened to you and your family in Palau was of great concern to me, and what men did to you broke my heart. But I was less concerned with your physical comfort and safety than I was the spiritual condition of, a lost and dying, of this lost and dying nation. And I, I knew God was aware all the time, but now I knew what he was aware of broke his heart. I also knew there was a higher priority than my comfort and safety. So you actually heard this? 
It's the only time in my life I've ever heard the audible voice of God. I'm not given to voices, but I was actually about to be introduced as the speaker in a church service to speak on the topic, Why Christians Suffer. And God spoke this to me, seated on the platform of that church, before I stood up to speak. It was a life-changing moment. Well, what would you tell people that maybe are going through horrific things. Maybe their son had been murdered. Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, their daughter had been violated somehow or abused. You, know, you could go on down the line. Mm -hmm. Somebody went through a horrific of divorce. What would you say to that one listening or watching today that, to tell that person right now? Probably the first thing that I could think of is God can be trusted. And we often told our children when they were young that trusting God is right, but it's not always safe because we automatically think that if we're trusting God, our life will be secure and safe and nothing will ever happen. But the truth is, you know, trouble comes to everyone, but God is still faithful and worthy of being trusted. And, and one of the things I have found is, you know, other, people's, other people can make wrong choices that affect our lives. And until God removes our freedom of choice, which we don't want Him to do, we're always going to deal with the consequences of other people's wrong choices and our own wrong choices. So as long as people make wrong choices, we don't want to allow their choice to determine who we become. We want our right choice to determine who we become. And actually from this now, you have a ministry that you travel all over the world telling people about forgiveness. Right. Yes, we do travel and, and, and share this story and we do teach on forgiveness. And uh, maybe in one of your other segments, we'll have time to talk about what we've learned about forgiveness and how not to allow other people's wrong choices to affect our lives. Well, and there's also a happy ending to this because you impacted that nation of Palau the night where you've been praying to God, you know, the night that the lightning had struck twice. You actually made a prayer that you wanted God to, to use you in that, that island. You know, we had been praying every night, God, whatever it takes, we want this nation to know you. We had our own idea how that would happen, and we had a plan of how God could use us to impact that nation. We had no idea that He would use what the enemy tried to use to destroy us as the greatest tool to bring this nation to Christ. In that nation, you were able to also evangelize to some of the key people that your daughter told me about that was actually able to impact the whole nation of Palau. Well, we went back for trial uh, in December of the year we were attacked, and, and men did go to prison for what they did to us, uh, 17 years, 21 years, and 27 years. But while we were there, Thursday night, the governor, who happened to be our landlord, invited us to dinner to speak with the chiefs of the villages near, you know, in his area, because they couldn't understand why I wasn't dead with the injuries I suffered, why I was alive and well. And I was able to share with them uh, about the power of a resurrected Christ and how much Jesus loved them. And literally at that point in 1987, plant seeds that would later reap a harvest when we went back to Palau in 2007 and God used our story to touch a nation. It seemed like when we were in Palau the first time, our pebble didn't even make a splash in the pond. But we realized in 2007, the ripples were still rolling and, and God was using those seeds to bring a tremendous harvest. So when you went back for this trial, you had to be on the stand and I'm sure it was very horrific to go back to be, you know, you, you probably questioned about everything that happened that night. What was going through your mind? Was that a very difficult scenario to go through, Sherry? Probably the hardest thing for me during the time that we returned for the trial is they didn't, couldn't ensure our safety as a family. And so we were constantly under armed guard. Our children were vulnerable. They had to be um, questioned on the stand. We weren't allowed to be in there with them. So the whole time, it was just a difficult time for the family. And you keep wondering, God, how are you going to use even this? And we learned later that there were people who came to that trial and spent day after day listening because they wanted to know how we would respond as Christians to such a difficult situation. So God was using even that. How many days did the trial take, Daryl? We were in country eight days. I believe five of those days were trial. Mm -hmm. And so did they put your two children on the stand too? Absolutely. And it was interesting because they tried all three men at the same time, three defense attorneys, one prosecutor, and uh, the kids had to testify alone in the courtroom without us being there. Very difficult. 
and, and yet, you know, God used that uh, in, a, in a very special way. And we just had to trust him each day because when I prayed about taking my family back, we felt it was the right thing to do. And, and God did use that for his glory. So there was three of the men got convicted and sent to, to prison. And so, but then in 2007, you were able to go back to Palau, which we're going to talk about on the next program. We just have a few minutes left. Daryl, as a father who literally saw your wife and daughter abused and son also tormented, which they told him that they were going to kill him if he didn't obey or get the keys mm -hmm. or whatever he needed from what I read, what would you say to those listening who really have gone through some really challenging circumstances, even though we're going to talk about forgiveness on the next program, but just in the, in the closing segments of this program? As a child of God, speaking to children of God, I would say that we're not just in the family of God, but the army of God. And God has given us a mission bigger than we can see. He's given us assignment one size too big for us. And so as we walk through life, we need to recognize it's just not all about us. God has a bigger plan. And as we share the rest of the story, you will learn why God allowed us to go through this circumstance. And it's very important for us to know that, that God sees the big picture. We're never out of his awareness, never out of his care. And his plan is for the eternal good of man so that most people can come to faith through our lives. And that's our prayer today, that lives will be changed and touched through our testimony. Well, and you know, we only have a few minutes left, but I want to pray with some of the people watching right now. Maybe you're watching and maybe you've been raped or molested, possibly even be by somebody in your family. That's what I'm getting a word of knowledge on. There's somebody watching now that has literally been abused or molested by their own family member. There's somebody watching that I also sense has been, been beaten very severely by somebody that was close to you. The Lord knows all the circumstances and the situations that you go through. And right now we want to pray for you because there's nothing that God can't deliver you out of. Mm -hmm. Even as Sherry was talking about when the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in the fiery furnace, the Lord delivered them out of the furnace. And so, but you have to believe, and the first thing you have to do is to forgive, especially those who did wrong against you. So we're just going to pray for you right now. Lord, together, Daryl, Sherry, and myself, we just reach out towards those watching this program right now. And we just ask you, Father, that those shackles and those chains that would try to bind and hinder this heart from growing in the love and the grace of God, we ask you, Lord, that you would relieve and deliver them from evil. And I thank you, Lord. The BBs are such a, an example of grace under fire. Lord, having his family horrifically attacked, going into a nation where they were just trying to evangelize with the gospel, only to turn it all around and eventually reach the country for Christ. Lord, if you can do that with them, you can do that with anyone watching the program today. So, Lord, we thank you for forgiveness. Let it be released into their heart yes. and let them come into the kingdom for such a time as this. And so, listen, Daryl and Sherry, thank you for coming to the program today, but I want you to stay tuned because the next segment we're going to be talking to them is about how when they came back to the island of Palau in 2007, how literally the whole country was changed and it shifted into something that literally made national headlines. I hope to see you next time on Now is the Time. Thanks for watching and remember, now is the time for you to know God's purpose and plan for His life. See you next week.